All right. Hi, my name is Elliot Clements. Uh, I'm from Lockheed Martin, and I'm uh, here to help. Uh, what I'm going to do is give you a quick uh, F-35C update brief specifically. I'm not going to talk about general F-35 programs. We have a lot going on, but uh, more specifically, uh, taking the F-35C to the boat last year and what we had to do to make that happen. A uh, quick bio, uh, Navy pilot by trade, uh, JO tour, uh, VF-86, test pilot at VX-23. Uh, did a department head tour in 136, uh, then moved over to Boeing for a few years as a reservist with VFC-12 as well, and then uh, picked up uh, with Lockheed Martin and my F-35 test pilot at PAX, uh, as well as a VFA-1 SAL CO. So I have a few jobs, try to stay busy. Agenda, we're going to talk about kind of the uh, standard F-35 design brief, um, and then uh, talk about shore-based carrier suitability testing, what occupied uh, most of our life last year. Uh, going to touch briefly on IDLC and DFP, we'll get into that, and then uh, we'll talk about DT-1. Lots of videos, I know it's uh, early in the morning for uh, tail hooks, so we'll try to keep you awake. F-35 design, we'll go to uh, the other presentation real quick. Okay, the big thing to note, obviously, the F-35C is much bigger than the other uh, two variants there. Uh, the big thing that you want to look at uh, is that 19,750 pounds of internal fuel. That's a lot of internal fuel for an airplane that has roughly the same burn rate as uh, the Super Hornet. Uh, so we can uh, stay along a pretty long time. Um, designed in uh, very low observable stealth, that's uh, take some thought. Uh, when you produce a new kind of clean sheet airplane like this one, uh, you want large capacity internal fuel tanks so you don't have to carry those drop tanks. Um, weapons are carried internally. We can carry about 5,300 pounds of weapons, JDM M120 uh, internally. A low emission uh, radar and avionics, uh, low observable seams uh, for the inlet, and then we have a, a buried engine. So the engine cannot be observed from a radar perspective uh, externally. Or, the, yes, so from an external radar or emission source. We have uh, DAS uh, and EOTS. DAS is a distributor aperture system which basically takes uh, six flush mounted IR cameras and fuses them into a 360 degree spherical uh, image for the pilot and projects it on our visor uh, so that we can literally look through the airplane or look at targeting as required. Uh, we have reduced signature nozzle, important for the IR spectrum there, stealth wise. Uh, shaping is obviously critical uh, for VLO. Um, and those are the critical components that you need to kind of design into an airplane uh, to make it stealthy. Uh, mission system suite, real quickly, we have an AESA. Uh, that AESA also works as a jammer. Uh, we have an EOTS pod, EOTS electro optical targeting system. Think of that as your T-FLIR and your ERST combined uh, with more like sniper type uh, qualities there. Uh, we have a pretty robust ESM um, and EW system and I'll just leave it at that. That uh, obviously contributes a lot to our SA. Uh, meter locator, ESM support. We have data links, uh, link 16, MATL, and VMF. So MATL is our advanced data link that communicates uh, primarily just between uh, F-35s. Okay, we'll go back to the uh, other presentation. Okay, we talked about the design. That's just kind of it's been the that's been the design for the past 10, 15 years. Nothing new there. What is new is uh, the carrier suitability testing that we've been doing over the past uh, year or so. And since this is tail hook, I uh, figured we'd talk about that. Um, for our shore based testing, we do that. Uh, some of you are probably very familiar with Pax River. Uh, this is uh, runway 32 at Pax River, and here at this installation, we actually have a steam catapult called the TC7 that pretty much mimics uh, exactly a steam catapult on a ship. Um, and then we have the Mark 7 site where we have one wire essentially, but that wire and all the machinery underground mimic what's on the ship. It's all instrumented so we know what kind of loads, we know what kind of uh, issues we might have. Uh, it's not just about the airplane, it's also about how the airplane interacts with the, with the wire. Uh, we have a camera here, you're going to see some footage from that camera and a couple videos. Um, we have a radar so we know exactly what our ground speed is. Uh, and that's pretty much it. 
the, LSO, the LSO tower is on the right side, so the lens is on the right side. So we always fly the ball uh, when we're doing these test points with the lens being on the right side. You actually get used to it. Test phases. We had to do a lot of stuff. I mean, look, look at all that stuff we had to do. The 900-pound gorilla in the room was something called structural survey. Okay, that's where we uh, have 14 endpoints or demonstration points uh, that we must show uh, during landing, arrested landings, shore-based. Um, to get those 14 endpoints took us about 125 to 108 or 28 actual traps. So you have to have very precise wind conditions for some of these. You have to um, touch down plus or minus uh, two knots ground speed. Uh, you have to land on center line or you have to land exactly 18 feet off center line. Uh, the demonstration points for structural survey take some time and they're easy to screw up from a pilot's perspective. Um, this one's going to take a little while to load. Uh, so at a shore-based facility like PAX, we cannot make the airfield rock and roll like the ship. Okay, so what we do, we have designed um, maneuvers that we do right before touchdown to simulate either the ship heaving or the ship rolling or us landing right wing down or that sort of thing. Roll yaw is one of them. You're going to have to back up. Okay, and then just kind of come up from the bottom if you can. Uh, you have to back up again. Wait, there you go. So on this one, we're going full stick, full opposite rudder, right before touchdown, landing at 17 feet per second. So it's one of those that is, uh, it's hard to do from the pilot's perspective because you do have a survival instinct that tells you not to do that. Uh, so we spend a lot of time trying to get that test point. We need to be uh, five degrees of roll, no more than seven, and greater than six degrees of yaw. So uh, again, not easy. Takes a few tries. High sink. We're at an airfield. We can't simulate the ship heaving into us or a high come down to land. Uh, so we fly uh, graduated approaches all the way up to between five and a half and six degree approaches to simulate uh, a hard landing. We go all the way up to 21 feet per second. That's our min threshold for demonstration. But if we go over 23 feet per second, we start breaking stuff. So we fly very precise approaches um, by essentially elevating that lens all the way up to between five and a half and six degrees, depending on the uh, winds for that day. Uh, go ahead and play. Oop. So we land pretty hard. It hurts because your engaging speeds are up around 145, 150 knots. So it's a it's a very dynamic arrestment uh, on the ship. Obviously, with the wind over deck and the ship moving, uh, your engaging speeds are more like in the 120s, or about 20 knots higher than that. Uh, not to mention, we're landing about twice as hard as you would normally land. Uh, 21 feet per second is about 1,230 feet per minute. Um, you guys are probably used to landing at six to 700 feet per minute on the boat. IDLC and DFP. Um, who's familiar with this? Any magic carpet lectures out there? Uh, people have been to. Okay, if I said, if you called the ball and you heard 40 knots, 42 knots starboard, would it make you nervous? Well, this control scheme makes it easy. Uh, what IDLC is is integrated direct lift control, and what that means is the throttle just doesn't control the engine; it controls the lift and the wing. So you are directly affecting almost instantaneously your glide slope with throttle control. You couple that with DFP, which is Delta Flight Path. Delta Flight Path is a flight control scheme that essentially uh, flies a very precise glide slope for you when it's engaged. And that's programmable. So most of the time, our basic angle is set at 3.5 degrees, so we have 3.5 degrees set in there. Uh, if you're low, in this case, um, you're basically hands off. But if you do find yourself low, let's say a ball low, then you pull back on the stick until you see a center ball, and then you release, and the ball should stay centered. Uh, it has gust rejection for the burble. It, um, it knows the winds because it has an INS system, and it's always calculating the winds. The only thing you need to do is plug in ship speed. If you plug in ship speed, then it can do all the math for you. I mean, it has an ace of radar for crying out loud. It should be able to figure this stuff out. It's just basic trigonometry. And so, uh, we've instituted this flight control mechanism in the airplane, and we flew it on DT-1, 
And I'm telling you, from the pilot's perspective, if you've been in the cockpit for six or eight hours and you just want to get aboard at night, you're going to want Delta Flight Path because it is very low workload. You essentially just engage it with the nose wheel steering button and you're on that three and a half degree uh, glide slope and you just make small deviations as required. If you're 42 knots starboard, you might have to make three corrections. You feel the airplane working. The airplane's working a lot, but you're doing very little except for staring at a centered ball. From the LSO perspective, they've said it looks a lot like a mode one approach. So it's very stabilized, a very low workload for the pilot. The HUD symbology is a little different um, because this is more applicable. Basically right here you have a, uh, a glide slope reference line. So the big joke with the Hornet, the little guys kind of tell us, all you do is put the thing on the thing and that's it. Well now you just put the thing on the thing on the thing and essentially you will be flying a precise three and a half glide slope to touch down whether or not the lens is even on. So we're making it, we know the geometry, we know the winds, we know the ship speed. If you put this uh, glide slope reference line on the lens itself and the SRVV, the ship reference velocity vector on the ship, then you will land with the center ball. I know there are a lot of skeptics out here, but it works and uh, it's, it's really nice. Shipboard testing. You have a new airplane like an F-35 built by a company called Lockheed. Um, here it is. What do you have to do to gain confidence that it is ready to go to the ship. Well, I showed you some of the, uh, the videos before. We beat it up pretty good um, at that site at PAX. We do a lot of catapult testing. We do a lot of uh, um, arrested landing testing to make sure that all the loads and the flying qualities are good. Uh, but at some point, you have to go to the boat. And that's what we did last uh, November 2014 uh, in an event called DT1, Developmental Test 1. Uh, it was on the USS Nimitz. Uh, we conducted basically the fly-on, obviously. We had four pilots that had to CQ. Before you start testing a new airplane, you want to kind of CQ with it in very nominal conditions. So we did that. Uh, then we started into uh, oops, approach handling qualities. Uh, so just doing a lot of approaches over and over again. It was kind of like a free license uh, to be the uh, uh, most junior cat one out there. So we were doing things like uh, Clara Low overshooting starts. Okay, and, and see if, if the jet could handle getting back on glide slow, back on center line. And uh, were there any characteristics of the airplane that we didn't like uh, for some of those off nominal starts? It was actually a lot of fun doing that stuff. Uh, catapult testing, we did basically a lot of, we did all the MINS testing, so we're shooting the airplane off slower and slower and slower to define uh, what the MIN um, setting is for the, for the uh, catapults. Uh, and then we did night operations, which is pretty unusual. Uh, for an airplane going out to the ship for the very first time. I don't think it had been done before on the first debt, the first at-sea debt of an airplane since the F-4 days. So we were leaning pretty for, uh, forward on this, but it worked out very well. We'll play this video. This is the fly-on. This is the first trap of the F-35C on the USS Nimitz. He caught the three wire. We were pretty excited about that. And this is CF-5. So we had two airplanes out there, CF-3, which is the third airplane built, and CF-5, the fifth airplane built. They both uh, caught the three wire there and got aboard safely. A lot of visibility on this one. I've never seen so many admirals, generals, and VPs up uh, crow's nest at one time. It was, um, there were a lot of heavy hitters up there. Uh, first catapult. Well, we did a lot of catapult testing uh, at PAX. Uh, one of the big unknowns still was steam ingestion. When steam comes down, the engine hits the compressor pl uh, plate. Usually that does bad things to the engine, but uh, we didn't have any issues with that. Go ahead and play. 
This was the next morning we did the first catapult. Then night operations. Uh, again, this was 10 days after the first trap we decided to go at night. And normally with flight tests, you, there's a build-up approach. So you start kind of conservative and you build up to something more risky. Well, this night was no moon, overcast, rain. Um, I think it was a 1,100 foot ceiling. And we went out and did night traps. Go ahead and play. See, it's dark. He's a little scared, so he likes the afterburner. Okay, so uh, we'll just play this kind of wrap-up video and then I'll answer any questions.